Good day and welcome to our presentation with Saxo Bank Chief Investment Officer and Chief Economist, Steen Jakobsen. My name is Dinao Zamela and before we head into the presentation, I just want to let you know that due to some technical glitches with the recording, a very short intro of Steen was cut off. However, the majority of the presentation and the salient points are still available. But should you have any queries, please do not hesitate to contact us, securities at standardbank.co.za. Thank you very much and enjoy the presentation. Once a year, we need to look at the next year and see what could and could not happen that would really change the dynamics of uh, the marketplace. Uh, there is today too much consensus uh, research going on on the street. Everybody agrees about the same old programs on TV covering business, talks about the same phenomena. And this year was no change, of course. The change was uh, not coming. It was Goldilocks. It was very much a year where stocks are going to do incredible, where Fed is going to be slow, gradually hiding interest rates and a year which very much would look like 2017 as a repeat. Of course, uh, we disagree with that, but the, the range of predictions have already caught a few themes, as you will see as we go through the, the items. So understand this clearly. These are 10 independent calls. They don't need to be aligned to each other. They don't need to be a red thread per se. But of course, lots of them are what you perceive to be negative in the sense that, that the opposite of uh, the consensus very often is exactly that, in particular, of course, since the great financial crisis. But let's get, uh, let's get going to the actual. So here is a, a very brief uh, overlook over the 10 calls. Fed loses independence of the Fed uh, as Treasury takes charge. Bank of Japan loses control of monetary policy. Uh, we see a big change uh, in number three. Uh, China issues CNY denominated oil futures. Volatility spikes on S&P flash crash. Uh, Midterm election, we call it to the left. We think the single biggest item on the European agenda is the what we call the Austria-Hungarian uh, alignment, which is very much anti-EU, but now getting more and more votes behind them, led by Austria, uh, Poland, Hungary, uh, and the Czech uh, Republic. Uh, investors is uh, fleeing the Bitcoin as government strikes back and it will ultimately go to the price of, uh, of issuance, which is about $1,000. And here is one for you particularly, uh, selected by me, South African researchers after what I define as an African spring, uh, where we see saw gaining 30% versus uh, emerging market currencies. Then we have Tencent, the uh, Chinese platform becoming bigger than, cap, than Apple in market cap. Uh, it will actually have to mean that Tencent goes twice. And then a more soft one, but one we really adamantly believe in, and that is that we will see a change, not only in the political space, but certainly also in the, in the boardrooms and in the CEO offices uh, across the world going forward, uh, and I explain you why. But let's uh, get into the actual predictions. So one, one of the things we've already seen this year, of course, is a huge spike in rates. Uh, last week I uh, saw the single biggest move in U.S. interest rates since uh, 91, 93 area. Uh, and what we said uh, um, here in this first call, uh, which was done in November, of course, was that the combination of uh, very high deficits could ultimately lead to uh, debt coming out of control. So in order to maintain this debt, the, uh, uh, the bondholders would want a much higher rate. Uh, so what we think is not actually calling that the interest rate will go higher. What we are calling is the potential for ultimately that U.S. Treasury, similar to what we've seen in Japan, will come in and fix the interest rates. So as you see at the bottom here, U.S. Treasuries uh, uh, will be uh, at a 2.5% yield cap. And, and don't forget right now, as we talk today, uh, the U.S. 10-year yield is at 285 basis points. The argument here clearly being in a world that has created nothing but debt, it will be impossible to make the market reprice all of the uh, interest rates according to market prices. So instead you replace that by a government cap of two and a half percent. The catalyst for this would be another explosion of debt, primarily through the fiscal impulse, a fiscal impulse we already seen 
uh, materialize, of course, through the tax rebate that was uh, done in the U.S. and which will cost a minimum of uh, $2 trillion on top of an already massive debt mountain. So watch out for interest rate. And I'll just make a, a comment on a non outrageous uh, format. The one thing you need to watch this year will be the 300 basis points uh, uh, neckline in 10-year U.S. treasuries. If we break that, we will for real see the equity market and risk on come under severe pressure. So keep a keep an eye on on 10-year U.S. It's already broken a 30-year trend, but technically it really needs to be confirmed about 300 basis point. As we talk today, it's trading about 285 basis point, so mere uh, 15 basis points away, which in in today's market is a very small move, but uh, keep that on on the radar as uh, as as both an outrageous call, but also a catalyst for your risk on risk off. So in Japan, similar sort of call, but a slightly different. Still, we are saying that uh, in Japan, Japan has been able to maintain a yield curve control. So what Japan said last year was, we are no longer going to be just printing money. We will only print money if you if Japanese interest rates are below zero. And as of course this year they have moved away from zero based on the U.S. taking the lead, but certainly also through China, then the ability of the Bank of Japan to maintain this uh, policy becomes obsolete. And when it becomes obsolete, the only way you can actually see that reflected will be in a stronger yen. Um, so we think that ultimately, first, the expectation would be, as John Hardy Rose writes here, that dollar yen should have an upward pressure for higher U.S. interest rate. But as the U.S. interest rate spills into a higher Japanese 10-year rate, uh, Bank of Japan can be forced to, to, to abandon this move. Uh, here, here's a big one, uh, and this uh, is reflected by uh, Ole talking about Petro Remembi. I think, and this is not only in the outrageous terms, but also in, in, in real terms, I think the most important change macro-wise in, in my lifetime is probably the Berlin Wall. I think the second most important one was the acknowledgement of the Chinese party uh, in October that China now wants to be number one. And I think it's important to understand that aspiring to be number one is very different from being one by one. When you actually say you want to be number one, you create policies that reflect that. And this is one of them. So what China essentially is telling the world is that, listen, we are the biggest commodity house. We are the biggest uh, oil importer in the world. A lot of the oil is not coming from the U.S. Uh, the oil that doesn't come from the U.S., we now want to reprice. And we think uh, being the biggest purchaser of oil in the world, we think that that's reprised to remember. Um, th that has two ramifications directly. Of course, it will mean that a uh, WTI and Brent will be under uh, attack as the exchange uh, and medium of oil and the pricing of it. Uh, but we know already that Singapore Commodity Exchange is thinking about launching a CNY contract. You know, the skeptic will argue that why would I want to do it in CNY? But I think that misses the point. The point here is that China is going to tell the world that if you want to do business with us in the future, we will no longer do it in what used to be the global currency of choice, dollars. But as we are aspiring to be the number one country in the, uh, in the world, you will have to do these transactions in CNY basis. And for a lot of countries like Saudi Arabia and Russia, that kind of makes sense because, of course, politically, we have already seen a big shift towards the East driven partly by early days Obama's policy, but certainly confirmed by the policies of the uh, Trump administration, which of course is America first and, and everybody uh, tenth uh, relative to it. So we think this is a very, very clear macro signal to the world that China is working on de-dollarization. So see it directly here as an outrageous call in terms of the petrol, remember, but also see this as the start of a active policy by China and through China, all the countries all the way from the eastern seaboard of China to Venetia in Italy and all the way down to Cape Hope in, in Cape Town. All these countries is expected to be playing nice to China and playing nice to China means that increasingly you will use their currency directly in transaction cross-border. Uh, 
to let me also state that right now 90% of all cross-border activity in the world is dollar denominated. So this is clearly something that can have a huge impact if only just 10% of this flow changes, it changes the whole dynamics of the process. So keep that, that in mind in that context. So over to the stock market, uh, and of course this being a very relevant topic uh, today, less relevant when we, we made this in December, but the, the point we are having on the stock market is not so much whether the market is cheap, expensive, whether interest rate is gonna kill it, but what we're saying is that everybody is doing the same thing. And mathematically, what everybody's doing is they're buying the biggest stocks first because every single stock index pretty much in the world is capital weighted. So when you buy the S&P 500, you buy the four or five biggest companies first and the smaller less. Uh, and of course, if you look at performance, even in a stunning year like 2017, a, long, a number of small and medium-sized stocks did extremely poorly but the larger one, we all recognize the Facebook, the Amazon, the Apples, uh, the Netflix, uh, and the Googles did extremely well. So that sort of compensated for this. What we are saying in this uh, outrageous call is that actually, to, in our opinion, the single biggest risk to the market is the market itself. And how can that be? Well, because the dynamics of all of the activity in the stock market today is that everybody trades through a robot, allocator, they trade through what is called risk parity, uh, they talk through different strategies that have different names, but essentially they're all doing the same thing. They are scaling the volatility of the portfolio relative to a historic uh, distribution, which is a normal distribution. And the one thing we know mathematically is nothing works like a normal distribution. So this is extremely risky. Put differently, what is happening in the stock market is that we are playing musical chairs with 10 chairs. In the classic uh, game, uh, you know, one chair would be missing when the music stops. We're saying when the music stops, it will be missing not one chair, not two, not three, but probably four or five chairs, simply because everybody has the same position in terms of the stock allocation, but also in terms of the same uh, strategy. So when volatility, as we saw last week, spikes, there will be a reaction. We think the real catalyst is not a move in the magnitude of two to three to two three percent we saw last week. But if we had a sustained uh, negative market for a week where the market was down five, six, seven, eight percent during the week, that will unleash a huge amount of hedging because all of these strategies then would then be having too much risk relatively to the volatility they accept. Or put differently, relative to the amount of money it should be able to lose, and then all of the mechanics will be to do the same thing, which is to sell the market itself. So watch out for this musical chairs that is going on. And you know, as we speak today, it's probably a very good day to do exactly that for this week. Watch whether the two and a half, three percent sell-off last week accelerates into a five to six. Then you will see the momentum really kicks in. But let me say, I'm not saying that will happen. But I'm saying in the context of the array to prediction and overall, we think the market itself is its worst own enemy. Also, you know, just historically, I've never seen that something which is an output, which is volatility from the stock market, is used as an input. You would not believe how many people have told me that you buy the equity market because volatility is low. Let me just tell you and explain to you, volatility is a derivative of the equity market itself. That is not something you use to put in as a reason why things are happening. Less, uh, less um, on the radar right now, but don't forget November, uh, you know, pretty much 50%, if not 60% of all uh, government elected uh, officials, not uh, representatives in the US government and, 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 and in the opposition will be elected. So midterm election is everything for the course of this year. What we're saying here is that when we look back at the election of Trump, he didn't really win, first of all. Uh, we think, uh, and I personally was very loudly saying that at the time, that Clinton was unelectable. But what I think we missed in the result is the fact that may, although Trump won, the real result was the Bernie Sanders uh, rise that we saw. The far left, this almost communist uh, party, person who came into the Democratic uh, Party 
and almost uh, won over Clinton in the first place. I think a lot of people are today arguing that he only lost because he was cheated on basically by establishment. Uh, maybe that's a lesson in itself. But what we're really saying is that if we look at the predictions for the midterm election, it looks, you know, despite uh, it shouldn't be possible, that uh, Democrats will have a hard swing to the left. And we think the voices of that and the carry of this message will be the young people, will be the people who are left behind in inequality. And I actually think personally that the tax rebate that came out would actually make this uh, actual subject even more likely to happen. So expect a very hard swing to the left in terms of the midterm. And that would essentially mean that Donald Trump is a lame duck in, in, in politics. I'm sure it's not going to stop him from doing more tweets and trying to upset everybody. But the fact of the matter is that his ability to navigate will be very different. And then immediately American politics will be about the next U.S. election, whether the Democrats can use this momentum into the next one, who's going to be the candidate and the like. But uh, do watch for this left uh, leaning. And I'll say this is not only in the U.S. It's something we will see in Scandinavia. It's something we will see in South Africa as well that the young people vote more, and certainly the young women is especially work more. So university cities and the like will be a big determinator of uh, the election outcome. Here is a European one. So, you know, the Austrian Hungarian empire yeah, was used to be big, but what is going on in Europe right now is that everybody's focused on the Italian election in March. We think that the bigger threat actually is the fact that a lot of these Europe skeptic countries uh, uh, which is, of course, Austria, Hungary, uh, Poland, uh, certainly, and the Czech Republic. They are all very, very aggressively trying to negotiate. Before, it was one-on-one -on -one against the EU, but now they have aligned themselves to be together. Um, and, and, of course, uh, if they are able to carry this charter and, and, and vindicating it with their voters, as they've clearly been able to so far, uh, then we have a what looks like a hard move to the right in European politics, but we also have a move which is really upsetting the whole uh, axis of Macron. And of course, what makes this topic even more relevant this year is the inability of the German government to form a, a new government. Uh, we have now uh, been, been, been in negotiations forever, and it looks like uh, we're getting closer, but still no cigar. So European politics, the anger of European politics being Merkel, she is really at risk uh, in our opinion. But overall, the German axis uh, with France is now being questioned by these Austria, Austria Hungarian links. Um, if that happens, we think that's a real risk to Euro. Having said that, our official view remains the same, that dollar is weaker and the Euro is stronger. But we do think this one is the outrageous thing that could really upset things when the if these Austrian-Hungarian uh, counterparts is able to to switch the uh, ongoing European uh, talk about uh, certainly immigration, but also the wider scope of uh, what happened next for Europe. And then the one everybody wanted to talk about in Q4, which no one wants to talk about now, uh, the cryptocurrencies. So, you know, we were lucky last year to call the, the rise of the cryptocurrencies. Uh, we didn't call it to the magnitude, of course, uh, of what did actually happen, but we will have another go this year. And, and what we are arguing is that, you know, Bitcoins and the whole range of cryptocurrencies have a number of issues against them. First of all, and most importantly, if they are deemed by monetary authorities to be a threat to money issuance, there will be regulation. Don't forget any political economic system is built on the ability to tax its citizens at the maximum rate possible and control the amount of money in circulation. Everything else is pretty much irrelevant. And clearly what we've seen this year is a move towards that. Even the US who are always very slow in terms of moving uh, is starting to act and, and shutting down funds and, and availability of instruments. Um, since the uh, launch of the futures and the CME and the CBOE, we have more transparency, but still this one story after the other comes out about fraud and the like. So now we see governments uh, doing this. And I, we think, and I've always said that, you know, certainly countries as uh, Russia and China, if you're a conspiracy theorist, uh, you would expect them to be a big part of what's going on in that uh, uh, space. And I think I agree with that overall. But remember countries like Russia and China 
they want to control everything through a platform. They want to control everything uh, in terms of what's going on, who owns it, and who's doing what. So what we see and will see is, of course, this uh, ability to be anonymous is going to go away. That legislation was passed the end of the month in uh, South Korea. I think that is increasingly what will happen across the, the board in, in terms of other countries. But I think the single biggest risk is that the uh, regulation on this space will be hard. And it should be hard. I mean, it's extremely speculative. It, it's, uh, you know, even at best, it's, it's dubious, whatever is the utility function of cryptocurrencies. The, the one sales argument we keep hearing is it's independent. It's uh, not censored and bank linked. But at the end of the day, what we've seen so far is that everybody wants to link it up against the bank system and that is validity of it. So very concerned. We argue that, you know, ultimately, and again, as an outrageous call, the whole uses of bitcoins and, and cryptocurrency can be forbidden and the context use will be regulation but more importantly that's uh, monetary authorities feel that it's uh, running out of control on the money issuance um, and then the uh, south african uh, story so as you know, those of you who have met me in South Africa, I've been very bullish on South Africa for a long time because I am a firm believer that the political system not only is uh, a good indicator of what would happen into the future, but a political system where one party can't do anything is really what dictates a, 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 a growing economy. Um, we've seen that certainly in Europe, uh, Belgium without a government for two years, every single macro indicator improved. Uh, Clinton's uh, presidency in the US, he, he pretty much did nothing but uh, smoke cigars during that period and it's the most successful economic uh, period in, in US history. Um, and I think that is also going to happen in South Africa and let me, me uh, outline this scenario. So what I noticed a couple of years ago was of course that the a city at city level in South Africa, we were starting to see a sharing of power, or rather, there was a 50 50 split between the ANC and the uh, DA in terms of uh, uh, mayorship and, and sharing of power. And in an environment uh, and in a, in, a, in a situation where you have uh, the inability of one party to over for, for, for ruling through majority, I really think you have a perfect situation because then you have to go across the aisle to actually create some new political mandate. Um, that has now translated, of course, into a more national agenda, although, of course, we are still in the dying minutes of probably Suma's uh, time as president. I, I think the transition into a new ANC, uh, ANC uh, mole will be very positive. It's already been interpreted very positive about the market. But I think it's, even in a so greater context, I think what I'm focused on when I'm very positive South Africa is the fact that we had one bad regime replaced by another bad regime. Now we're going to go for the third version, which is the sharing between those two bad regimes and trying to move the agenda forward. If there's one country in the world that can really thrive through this, it is South Africa. You have huge amount of upside. I know when I meet you uh, around uh, the South Africa, you're all very depressive and, and for good reasons, I think. Um, but I think, you know, South Africa's magnitude and, and ability to, to be part of the sub-Saharan Africa growth is, is, is humongous. Um, I think there are indications in Zimbabwe that's changing as well. So I think the South African uh, lead will be very, very significant. Uh, so I have uh, decided to call it the African Spring. Whether I get disappointed uh, one more time will be to be seen, but uh, I really think there are a huge upside. And let's not forget the South African Rand must be the cheapest currency in the world. Uh, there, there are simply significant value in this great country, uh, uh, in my opinion. This one is an interesting one. Uh, Tencent, the uh, Chinese platform, will be bigger than Apple. Uh, looks very unlikely as we talk today. But I think what you need to understand and the argument we make is that think about all of the Chinese companies, the major companies, the Alibabas, the JDcoms and the likes. They operate on a state monopoly sanctioned platform. So basically, the Chinese government wants them to be successful. They want them to grow because it's much easier for the Chinese government to control what's on the context, what is flowing, what other information can they extract from it if they have one or maximum two platforms that is competing. Whereas we in 
the rest of the world increasingly will look towards getting away with the monopolies that companies like Alphabet, uh, Google, uh, Amazon, and the likes have. And don't forget, in a legal term, a, a monopoly is when you have more than 25% market share. So the reasons why you've done so extremely well in the FANG stocks is partly because the technology initially was great, but from an economic point of view, the real reason you're doing it is because they all run monopolies, which means they can set the price much, much higher with no supply elasticity in terms of how much you buy. So basically your demand is independent of the price, which you of course most clearly see in the case of Apple, but certainly also see in, in companies like Amazon and the others. So we think there is an arbitrage going on here where Chinese companies will be allowed to grow forever. Uh, Peter Gunry is predicting that the 10 biggest companies in the world in 10 years time from now will be Chinese. And on the other hand, we have European and, and US markets under increased scrutiny relatively to this monopoly exercised by the competing companies in the West. We clearly think that the monopoly allowed companies in, in China will do better. And then the, the final one, which is kind of a, short, uh, a soft one, but uh, we think it's uh, time that women smash the glass ceiling. Not only, and, and one I have to admit, one of my female colleagues she thought we were uh, indicating that it is outrageous that, that, that it didn't have a list of middle care. We think it's outrageous that women not already are 50% of the leader uh, C, C suites uh, around the, the world. But what we want to make clear to people is that in a world of increased inequality, in a world with less reforms, in a world where women are better educated than men on average, uh, where women vote more than men, we think this is the time where women actually uh, stand up and, and, and wants to be counted and become progressively more involved. And what's very interesting is that if you look at the, the uh, top US executives, the women constitute less than 6% right now. We think that will double, which doesn't sound like a lot. But what I think is more interesting for you as a, as a market player is that the companies run by CEOs, uh, which are female, does better and they are higher compensated. In other words, in a marketplace environment, these women actually do better because they're paid higher, so they have done you know, different. So what we're really saying is that we think that activating women in some countries that have low women participation rates in the working force, but overall we think both in politics and in the, in the C-suites, we need more women who are not testosterone driven and we need a different model, we need a different approach, and, and why not a tap uh, the, the, uh, the, the best way to do that, which is to live up to what we've said we wanted to do for the last 100 years and to create equal opportunities in, in, in the working space. Um, so rounding, rounding it all up and going back to the initial space here, so although there is not a theme, I said beginningly necessarily, there is one indirectly here, one is that the Volatility and the low levels we've seen since the great financial crisis is unsustainable. It is that China will rule through monopolies in, in company space. It is that there is too much inequality in the world, not only in terms of um, the, the classic one, which we see that, uh, that, that employees are getting too little pay, but also in terms of women. And we think they, on the upside, we think there's a huge amount of upside in South Africa. We think uh, finally uh, that uh, the crypto hype will disappear somewhat. We don't think that that, that the story is over. We don't, we, we're not saying necessarily that that uh, that blockchains and the likes is not uh, uh, survivable or long term. We think actually it's a great idea. It's a great concept, but cryptocurrencies is is not the way to play it. We think China is moving towards a de-dollarization and active policy of de-dollarization. And the risk for this year, as I started out by saying, remains the same. In a world that has, and note this number, $253 trillion worth of debt, one percentage point rise in interest rate is a massive disaster and will lead directly to a recession and probably a crisis which is worse than eight or nine because at the end of the rainbow, nothing has changed except the rhetoric. Now we are all believing you hear corporate CEOs supporting Trump's America first, despite the fact it makes zero sense as a human being, as an economist, or most importantly, as a trader. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steen. Um, 
Okay, so we do have a few questions. Um, if anyone else would like to send questions through, please, you can send through questions now. Um, in the meantime, I'm just going to check. So, um, sorry, my screen is a bit tiny. just want to make it bigger. Um, China Petro Renminbi, what is the time frame and what impact will that have on the US dollar? Um, I perceive this to be the biggest threat in the foreseeable future. Can you comment? I on very that? much. Agree. Yeah, I, I agree with with, with uh, the question. I think this is the single biggest change of macro dynamics we've seen uh, certainly in the last uh, twenty years. Uh, and I think we know for a fact that the Shanghai uh, Commodity Exchange already is in the process of testing uh, its system to go to a CNY denominated contract. What will be interested is is really how they're going to attract the flow. I think they can force the hands of Saudi and others, but whether we as a investors are also allowed and to play that game. There's been a small rumor that the CMY contract could be partly uh, paid in gold as well. So that, that is an interesting context. But I really think we are talking certainly inside this year, but uh, in the case of Chinese uh, sources, they want to do this uh, around uh, late summer, as per usual, in, in the Chinese. Don't forget, we're moving into the lunar um, uh, year uh, holiday now in China. So we, we're looking at uh, Q3, Q4 for this. But I agree with, with the premise of the question, which is this is one of the biggest upsetting ones. What does it mean for the dollar? If dollar goes down in transaction and value, combined with the rhetoric of the Trump America first, I think we we're going to see a continuation of the trend. Don't forget the dollar has been weaker throughout 17. I think that will continue. I don't even think a higher uh, projected Fed will be able to take the dollar uh, for more than a correction because at the end of the day, we all know there's too much dollar denominated debt in the world that needs to be written off. So I, I think we see a huge change driven again, and as it's done in the last 20, 30 years by Chinese macro changes to the overall uh, environment. Thank you, uh, Steen. And Doe wants to know, what is the impact on the dollar if um, the U.S. hikes their interest rates? Well, I've uh, tried to show you a few charts when I've been around in South Africa. It's actually quite of interesting that the Federal Reserve hikes generally lead to a lower dollar. And it actually goes to the first question for the reason. The reason is that the rest of the world uses the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency. When you have a reserve currency um, uh, being the dollar, then what happens when the U.S. interest rate goes up, the price of money goes up, clearly. In order to compensate that for the non-U.S. Uh, citizens, you make the dollar cheaper in order to regain that equilibrium. So in other words, the U.S. is the only place in the world where a higher U.S. interest rate, which intuitively should lead to a stronger dollar, actually leads to the opposite. And I think I shared certainly with the Standard Bank's uh, clients over the time, but uh, you know, I'm very happy to put it on Twitter as well after this speech to show you that it is very, very rare that the dollar actually goes up with a higher Fed high. And don't forget, just uh, recently we've seen that European growth is actually exceeding US growth. And I think personally that is one of the major changes for the next 10 to 15 years. I think continuously the European trade uh, growth will be higher than the US. We are simply uh, further back in the business cycle. The U.S. business cycle has already peaked, in my opinion. Uh, so what you see, you will see dropping U.S. growth uh, into a hiking cycle. So you can risk, at worst case, a stagflation in the U.S. At best case, you're going to have a deflationary environment through a, uh, a much higher interest rate. Thanks, Dean. Um, Robert wants to know, have you got an outrageous view on golden oil? Um, is there anything good that you expect in the markets apart from Tencent? For every action, there's an opposite reaction. So how can we benefit? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we generally have a gold call every year. I think gold stands in front of a massive rise. I think some of the attention, attention in, in, in second half of last year was uh, taking over to Bitcoins and cryptocurrency for some players. But I just uh, listened to Rangel's uh, reporting this morning, and it's very interesting. Rangel's CEO says there simply isn't enough assets uh, being developed in gold. So we have a ma ma major shortages in, in gold's ability to produce. 
Uh, I think gold and gold mining stock stands in front of a massive upside. And, and the interesting thing, of course, gold mining is that uh, the extraction cost is down at $400, roughly on average. Uh, cash flow is positive through the price, but I also think that there's the demand will increase significantly. So I'm very, very bullish on, uh, on gold. On oil, I've said for the longest time, and I've been partly wrong, that I think it's a 25, 65% range if we talk about crude WTI. Um, right now, it's, uh, it's trading at the high end through a uh, small combination of geopolitical risk and uh, excessive uh, growth uh, expectation for, uh, from the U.S. You have a U.S. president talking about 5 to 7% top-line growth in the U.S. Uh, we're going to have exactly what we had in the last eight years. We're going to have two and a quarter, two and three quarters growth in the U.S. So I think, you know, I'm looking for levels to, to short the, uh, the oil. And I could easily, in a very bad environment, see go oil go down to $25. So if you rephrase, if I allow myself to rephrase the question, which put should I buy uh, in the market? I would buy a, a 20 delta put in the oil market. I really think that's going to make you a lot of money this year, uh, as we have extremely uh, complacent uh, expectation on growth. Thanks, Dean. Um, and EJ wants to know, what do you mean uh, when you say cryptocurrency is not the way to go? Do you mean blockchain? Um, yeah, what I, what I mean is that if you think about cryptocurrencies, uh, the different uh, cryptocurrencies are really uh, different technology stages or version of technology trying to sell the same concept. So ultimately, at the end of the, uh, end of the day, only one technology will survive. So the relative price between the different cryptocurrency is based on uh, its utility, uh, its, uh, of course, quality but also is energy consumption. So Bitcoin being the most expensive in terms of energy, but having had very high brand recognition and the like. Bitcoins as a, and our cryptocurrencies overall for me is not interesting. It is the underlying technology that survives. So right now, a lot of people will argue that Ethereum of course has a superior uh, platform. Uh, then there are others who talk about Danone and all of the other technologies. But remember your cryptocurrencies are competing seamless uh, technology developments that you engage in. But what Bitcoin and, and the other cryptocurrency is not doing, which it's portraying itself to do, is to create independence of the normal market of governments and everything else. Because what will happen, and that is the, my point, is that governments will, if this becomes too big a market or becomes too volatile, they will step in, they will control the market, and ultimately the governments will use cryptocurrencies and certainly blockchain to do more surveillance of what happens. And it will probably be blockchain that is the way to have a global tax for corporations and the like. So, so I think the Bitcoin space is very interesting. It's, it's, it's not that I'm, 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 I'm deeming it to be useless or anything. I'm just saying the, you have to remember it's competing technology. It is big blockchain that, that, that really carries it. It is not a competition. It is not a currency. It is not a commodity. It's, it's a game token that goes on until someone wins the technology game, then of course, it's gonna be a magnificent investment for that uh, surviving strategy in my opinion. But let, let me remind me, I'm 53 years old, so I'm probably the wrong guy to ask about uh, cryptocurrencies. <laughs> um, and a question from Ryan, uh, what is your view on the growth of electric vehicles and the influence on liquid fuels? And I know you touched on this when you were in South Africa, but um, perhaps you can just recap quickly. Yeah, so we see we see a bigger and bigger drive uh, on, on this electrification. And I think what I said in South Africa, and which I really still think, is that electrification and, and, the, and certainly the battery uh, technologies that comes with it, it's going to be the biggest CAPEX expenditure uh, rise we have seen in our lifetime. This is similar to when we went from horse carriages to, to engine uh, cars, uh, the Ford evolution. Why? Because think about batteries as the way to store energy. If we get the battery technology right, we can increase the productivity and reduce the cost of alternative energy sources like sun, wind, hydro, and everything else. We can use the cars uh, today, which is only taking battery from the grid to be storage of uh, batteries. Of course, when you're charged, you can actually allow the utility to take a uh, drain some of it if it's three o'clock in the, in, in, at night and the like. So the efficiency, the utilization will be a huge discount on the price of energy going forward, in my opinion. 
But of course, in the initial phases, what we'll see is that that you still have to boil some oil, as boil rather, uh, you have still have to uh, to to burn some oil to 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 create it and use the traditional resources. But the technology, the more than it's almost super exponential in terms of the development and the amount of money being thrown at this issue is massive. Volkswagen, as I think I mentioned, in South Africa, 60 billion. Uh, Nissan is now launching its its new car in the first quarter of this year. Uh, again, battery driven. Uh, we see nothing but battery uh, focus. So, so I really think that um, that uh, the way to play this is through uh, like the ETF, LIT ETF, lithium, which is the battery chemical side of it, but also finding the, sort of the companies and, and the trends that that works this way. Because of course, at the end of this is the fact that we need to reduce pollution in China, in 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 India, and in a lot of cities around the world. And this is the cheapest, fastest way to do it. And it's again, it's sanctioned by China, which means that immediately, uh, you know, today there are already excess taxes on um, combustion engine cars in, in China, and I think it will be similar to the rest of the world. So I don't think the cars is the way to play it. I think it is to, to look at the chemical companies, look at the companies involved in the battery, uh, but, but I'm very, very bullish on that. Uh, very, very bullish. I think, you know, when you throw so much money at a certain problem, it will be solved, or at least taken to a high level of productivity. Thanks, Dean. Um, okay, and then a question from Alexi is, when the Fed undertook their last tightening cycle, subprime housing was the catalyst for the global financial crisis. Could the current volumes of retail money and cryptos be the catalyst for a larger financial crisis when the Fed starts hiking and possibly pull other EM rates higher with it? Uh, great question, but remember all of the money in cryptocurrencies are paper money. Very little of that money actually has a transaction into the real economy. And that's one of the reasons why it cannot be a catalyst for a crisis. I do think, however, it can be a psychological signal going, that's going on. I mean, I don't think it's random that Bitcoin is having you know, the, the worst three to four weeks uh, at the same time as we see increased volatility in the foreign exchange market. But, but I think the, the catalyst is more the market itself. I mean, just go back a couple of weeks and read the, all your business papers in, in South Africa. They were full of managers and guys like me telling you that, you know, 18 is going to be great. It's Goldilocks. It's a gradual high, blah, blah, blah. And here we sit, you know, three weeks later and the volatility, everybody's concerned. Uh, we had a massive move last week. Um, so, you know, for me, the, the risk is not crypto, but uh, you're right to look for a catalyst. I think the catalyst is the higher interest rates because the one thing we do have a lot of, of course, is a huge amount of debt. And that is uh, certainly a case for the private sector, but it's even more the case now, certainly in the developed market through the corporate sector. The corporate uh, treasuries of, of different companies, it's, it's up to the its neck in, in, in the issuance of debt. And that's gonna be the issue. So I think the driver will be the uh, combination of slightly higher inflation expectations but basically that, that interest rate is going to kill the, uh, the Goldilocks. Thanks, Dean. Um, and then I've got two questions on China, so I'm just going to lump them through together. The f um, Lump them together. The first one is from Johan, who wants to know how much impact do you believe the Middle East, the Saudi bond in issuance may have on China or US economies or currency strength? And then Harry, um, Harry wants to know, would you suggest investing in the China stock exchange rather than the U than US to benefit from the CNY? Um, and then can you also just um, expand on what CNY is or which company it is? So CNY is the Chinese uh, denominated currencies, which has done extremely well. Um, in terms of investment, I think, yeah, I understand the question clearly, but I think what you want to do is to go to some of these more theme-based investments uh, instead of looking for a single company's exposure. Uh, so the question before on electrification is, is a play you can do in theme-based. You can play on uh, the rise of urbanization. Don't forget China today has an urbanization rate that mimics what the US has in the 1920s. Uh, teens. Um, and, and same with uh, India. So I think a lot of the, the, the drivers long term of return in an in environment, even of a negative market, is going to be the fact that China needs to move to the city. They, they're going to be having a higher middle class. 
electrification will be ongoing because it is driven by the supply. So I think the, to a large extent, what you want to do is move away from single stock to more theme based. So you get a broader, broader sort of uh, tag onto what is going to happen to the dynamics of the marketplace. Um, so that, that would be the answer in that. In terms of the Middle East issuance of bonds and the whole Middle East situation's impact, um, of course it has an impact on the on the um, on the oil price uh, and overall. And and I have to say, if if you ask me uh, uh, off record, which will be the single biggest risk, I think it's uh, the Middle East for this year. Um, I was in Dubai just before launch, uh, not launch, but before Christmas, um, and. Dubai felt, and what I heard on the ground is the worst I've seen since 2000, uh, 2008, 2009, where we had the crash. Basically, this whole you are with us or against us line taken by Saudi Arabia is increasing the religious issue as a, as a major theme. Uh, a country like Dubai, who's always the, play, praised themselves for being a place where you could be whoever you want, under which religion you wanted, they are you know seeing people leave, certainly seeing a lot of Iranian people leave the, 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 the area, of course, because of the alignment against Iran from Dubai with Saudi. Um, and I think overall, the Middle East, uh, the, at the time of the issuance of uh, the Saudi bond, I was in, uh, in the Middle East that week. And uh, I think it's massively interesting because, of course, you get a, get a higher carry for uh, access to the biggest oil reserve. So I think the story is still the same. You have these countries that never had to ride on debt before. Now they rely on debt, creating more debt, supplying more debt to the marketplace, create big opportunities, hopefully create some and install some, some investor uh, control. But all, all the Middle East can only impact the rest of the world through energy and energy prices. But I think there is a significant risk for a resurgence of this uh, era spring again. I, I, when I travel around that region, it's privately my biggest concern. Okay, and we have a few questions on Korea from Robert and John, who, um, sorry, not John, um, from, yeah, Robert. And he just wants to know, um, do, you, do you think that um, we can anticipate a conflict on the Korean Peninsula? And I suppose somewhat related, um, but not really. Do you anticipate a second term for Trump? <laughs> Let's deal with the second one first. Uh, I think it's very unlikely that Trump, I, I think he thinks he's going to have a second term. Uh, but if I'm right about the political changes that's ongoing in the U.S., that's, uh, he, he represents 30 percent of the U.S. population. Um, as long as the, the opposition, Democrats, can't find someone who represents 35 is an issue. But I'm pretty sure between now and, and the actual president election, they'll find that. And I'm also pretty sure that it will go uh, south for, for Mr. Trump in terms of the economy and the performance. And what a lot of people forget is that actually Obama's first year as president was uh, a higher return than Trump's first. So may, may, maybe we should also put it into context. Um, in terms of the, sorry, the first question was uh, on, I, I forgot, sorry, old age. Um, no, it's fine. Um, do you think there'll be a conflict on the Korea, uh, Korean Peninsula? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Yeah. Um, my limited ability of accessing U.S. sources said for the longest time that October, November was, was the risk. I think I also said that when I was in South Africa. Uh, I still see it as an issue. I, I think if, uh, but I unfortunately think it's all driven by politics. So the more insecure Mr. Trump is and the less certain he is he's going to get away from this uh, Russia collusion uh, ongoing talks, the more likely he is he's going to force the government. As, as you probably, and I think the, the, the person asking the question already know that there is this uh, number of different strategies uh, being leaked to the press that the U.S. is considering. Of course, that could in itself just be a strategy, but, uh, you know, the ability of, uh, of, of U.S. politicians to keep anything secret is very, very small. So, so I think it's still likely, of course, the Olympics coming up, it's not an issue, uh, but, but look for a deterioration in Trump's um, ability. Uh, look for him to ramp up the uh, attack on other, everybody else before that happens. But clearly it is a risk, and I think that there is a, a potential risk for miscalculations here. But uh, 
I think it takes something desperate for him to go in right now. But on the other hand, as a as an enforcer of the nuclear um, uh, act, uh, it's very difficult to sit by and just allow this to happen if they ever shoot uh, launch a missile. So, great question, and great question always meet the same answer from economists. Uh, it's an interesting question, but <laughs> but the uh, but the fact is, I, I think it's it, it will be entirely driven by his political ability to to stay on top of this uh, Russia investigation that is ongoing. Okay, and then just two questions from David and John um, on Brexit and Europe. Um, David wants to know how far behind will Britain be at the end of 2018 and are there any circumstances for calling off Brexit? And John wants to know, will the diplomatic tension between Western and Eastern Europe be resolved soon? And if so, what impact will that have on the Euro's value and what will the position be with Brexit? Um, will the European stance change? Or not? Yeah, so I, I think a number of people now is coming to the position on the the March next year date for the exit not to be in place. I think it, that will be an extension of the timeline. Uh, clearly, this week is critical for uh, PMA. Um, I don't think even the UK know what they they want, and it's pretty difficult to negotiate an actual uh, exit trade when they don't actually know what they want to do. So, so I think it's very likely we will see a delay in, in a vote. And I think to some extent from a market perspective, that dilutes the whole issue because it becomes less and less likely it's going to be a hard exit. Uh, I think you all know my line has been the same all the way through this. I think it's, it's liberating for UK. I think it's liberating for EU to have this conversation in the first place. And I never thought that Sterling would be under attack and, and neither has it so far. Um, but, 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 uh, but the overall Brexit uh, take for me is that yeah, at the end of the day, we're going to have a deal that suits both the UK and, and, and Europe. Don't forget, Europe runs a massive surplus against the UK. So in an environment where we want to continue to grow, have employment and the likes, we certainly don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by, by, by making the, the issues difficult. I think the, the big move we've seen in Europe in terms of Brexit is the fact that uh, Merkel uh, as she de facto is not, on, she's only a temporary uh, chancellor in Germany, has allowed Mr. Macron to take the centre stage. And he has very clearly said that he wants to work with the UK to find a deal that suits both parties. I think the French line is the one that's going to prevail at the end of the day. I think the second question on the East-West uh, coalition uh, they're on, um, clearly already now, uh, EU have taken the unusual step to pull the uh, Poland in front of the constitutional court um, and they were going to have sanctions. So I actually think there could be an escalation on the East-West alliance uh, into this, which is kind of surprising, so, you know, considering everybody's having high growth and things are going relatively well. Imagine, and I think that's the later part of the question, imagine what happens if Europe slow down again uh, or these economies is underperforming, then we have the, the higher risk of this becoming a real issue. So, so my question is, my answer is really, as long as we have enough growth for everybody to to be happy, I think it's a it's it's a boiling issue, but but I don't think it will explode. But I think it becomes an explosive, uh, toxic uh, thing, if um, if if growth starts to slow down and we see a global recession or a stock market sell off, then you will really see the the need for these politicians to make a claim on the anti-immigration, more skeptical Europe, which got them into the office in the first place. But, but I agree with both these questions. These two questions are for the European in, uh, investment this year, uh, critical. I think the first one, Brexit, is going to go away and, and slip into to, to the quiet. And I think East-West relative to Brexit, I don't think there is a connection. If anything, um, it would have been better for Europe to have Brexit, the UK at the table. But you know, things, that, things are as they are. And, and, and I don't think, but I, but I certainly agree that the East-West relationship can get worse if we see economic conditions, stock markets uh, come down, and then it can become a real issue, and that will be massively negative for the euro, uh, in my opinion. That it, it's far beyond what the Italian election can do, even with uh, Five Star Move in becoming uh, the biggest party in uh, in Italy. It's it's not. Uh, I really think that is the single biggest issue. Great, thanks, um, Steen. And then just coming back to South Africa, or um, Colin wants to know. Do you think the move to um, the national health plan uh, will have a, ma a massive, massive negative impact on growth? And a second question from um, 
I can't see it now, from Des is, do you think South African stocks will benefit from um, the potential change in leadership in government if our president is recalled this year? So on the second one, I, I think we have to agree that um, a large majority, if not almost all of the US companies in South Africa, the bigger companies are, are excellent global companies that run really well. I think JSE is remarkable in the, in the fact that uh, you know 80% of the volume comes from overseas sales. So clearly, great export machines. I don't actually think that you know if five lines down the top, five years down the line, uh, you know you will be driven by these companies' ability to operate in a global uh, uh, environment rather than in the South African one. So yes and no. There, of course, you know if there is a change and there is a confirmation, there will be a relief uh, rally from that. But I think the JSC will be driven by external factors. I think I said to you all uh, again and again that unfortunately South Africa is placed certainly for equity investors where 90% of the return is going to come from external factors and less than 10% from, from domestic. The National Health Plan, I think, um, yeah. is it too expensive? This is wrong. It really needs to be redefined in, in the context of uh, what is uh, credible. So I will, I will give you a typical politician answer to that question saying that if the plan is credible and financed and there is a support for it, it will be very positive. Um, but if it fails to, to create that credibility, and I think not, not being the bloody outsider here to uh, a foreigner here in the outsider, but I think credibility is a big issue in, in terms of everything that being brought far forward in the political scale uh, in, in South Africa. So, so my intuitive answer would be it's slightly negative in the short term, but it makes sense to have a, a national health plan. It makes sense to secure that people, you know, have access to schools. Uh, I mean, uh, it is the foundation, as I said to you guys again and again, it is to be better educated. Productivity comes from education and health. Uh, so we need, we need focus on that and we should have focus on that as well. Thanks, Dean. And just the last question um, from Gavin is, given the pre uh, predictions, what is your general advice to long-term equity investors, both globally and in SA, regarding positioning themselves for 2018? So long-term and 2018. <laughs> um, contradiction in terms almost. Of course, sir, I mean, I, I think the time now is to protect what you have. We had an amazing run in JZ, but also in the global stock market. I think, and I said to you long, long time, for a long, long time, I think the right way to approach this to, is to think in my four times 25%, 25% asset allocation, 25% in fixed income, 25% in equity, 25% in commodities, and 25% in, in cash or real estate. If you rebalance back to that, because if you've kept your equity stake for the last five, 10, seven years, your equity stake is 80%. So I really think it's, it's, it's back to basic. It is just reassigning equal uh, upside and downside potential for the equity market. But, but having said that, you know, on the currency side, I really think as a, as a, a South African-based investor, you have to be very, very clear that South African rank could be much, much higher over the next two to three years. So my number one issue would be the currency impact on my foreign investments. In the local market, I'm going to get a little bit of, as we talked about, premium from, from the political changeover. But again, the, the real traction comes from reforms, comes from improvement of infrastructure and the likes. I think it is coming, but I think that is more than a 2018 issue. So for 18, defensive, get back to basics, protect what you have would be my top line uh, advice. But in terms of investment, if we're looking sort of where to place money, go after the themes, get away from buying single companies, go towards buying themes that you know are long-term sustainable, urbanization, uh, the, the battery technology we talked about, the ability of mining being so cheap, uh, certainly gold mines being so cheap relative to cost. So look at what is down and, 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 and beaten right now relative to what is excessive. And certainly the excessive parties stay out of the US. The dollar is going weaker. The US companies that have done extremely well will, will meet uh, monopoly charges. Uh, and, and I think uh, if, if looking for more liquid market, I think something like sterling can still perform. I think Europe will still relatively well and it's much cheaper for, for the 25% you have. But being defensive and first and foremost, protect the money you have for the next uh, six to nine months. 
Okay, Steen, thank you very much uh, for a very enlightening and insightful presentation. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Um, I see a couple of thank yous. So thank you everyone for listening in and thank you for the great questions. I think um, Steen, you handled that very well. Um, for anyone who just wants a recap of um, the presentation, it will be available on the OST um, website by tomorrow. So if you need to just recap, you'll have it available. Otherwise, I think, Steen, can they contact you on Twitter? Absolutely. Any Anyone, you know, just, uh, find me on Twitter. I'm, I'm available. If there's a few charts that need explanation, uh, feel free to, to, to contact me. And thanks, everybody, for the great question and, and the audience. Great. Um, and Steen, could you just give us your Twitter handle, please? Well, I knew you were going to ask me. Uh, <laughs> Steen underscore, I think it's Steen underscore Jacobson, two E's and Jacobson with a K, of course. All right. Steen well, Jacobson, yeah. All right. Otherwise, just go Steen Jacobson Twitter on Google, and I think it's pretty sure it comes up. Okay. Thank you, Steen, and thank you, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your week.